I started doing work in um, gender violence, specifically domestic violence, back in 1978 um, when I started working in a shelter, the first shelter that was uh, developed in Little Rock, Arkansas. And um, over the course of time since then, I became increasingly unhappy with um, the kinds of structures we were building, the kinds of options we were, we were uh, providing for victims. So my remarks come out of the feminist justice kinds of things that were echoed, um, or, or rather were stated by Lee um, and, and echoed by Mimi and Joan. Um, I'm critical of the crime-centered kinds of responses that have dominated the U.S. approach and, and that of so many other countries. Um, and I turn to restorative justice as one of several ways of thinking differently about how we respond to gender violence. So for me, the, the current feminist debates about how to respond to peer-to-peer -peer campus sexual assault are the latest in an ongoing feminist disagreement about the role of punishment in transforming the social conditions that create gender violence, and maybe even a disagreement about what the social conditions are that create gender violence. And, and that may be, um, that may be the, the, the most important disagreement about which we speak very little. So I think that the benefits of restorative justice, some of the benefits of a restorative justice response are not going to be news to this crowd. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Um, I'll just mention the, the opportunity for um, a victim of sexual assault um, to speak, tell the narrative in her own voice, um, to receive validation um, as well as protection, and the opportunity um, for a person who has done sexual harm to uh, have his or her humanity recognized and to receive rehabilitation kinds of options and reparative options. I think those are well known to this audience. What I think, um, if I can add something to this conversation, it would be to talk a little bit about what I am uh, provisionally referring to as an anti-subordination restorative justice practice. And I think that that's exactly the kind of practice that we can do on college campuses. I think that the structure is there. I think the opportunities are there. And I think that the example that happened here at Dalhousie really illustrates um, in, in the most compelling way um, what those opportunities are. So what do I mean by an anti-subordination restorative justice practice? I mean a practice that seeks to address and change the social supports for gender violence the social supports, that includes the male peer networks and the structural inequalities that create and maintain much of the violence that we experience. I also mean a practice that's aware of and responsive to intersections of race, class, sexual orientation, sexual identity, able-bodiedism, that frame experiences of victimization, what do I mean by that? That, that relate to, have some relationship to risk of being a victim, to the kinds of victimization one is likely to experience, and to the social meaning that is attached to the victimization. And at the same time, shape institutional responses um, and um, the, kinds of, the kinds of institutional responses and the degree to which um, bias infects those institutional responses. So I think in the canvas context then, an anti-subordination RJ practice um, has the ability, the potential, and, and we clearly see this again in the Dalhousie report, to interrupt, name, address, peer networks that support male violence against women. So a great deal of the research on campus sexual assault demonstrates that campus sexual assault is highly correlated with um, uh, membership in peer networks that support misogynistic thinking, hostile masculinity, um, and, um, and, and gender violence. Coupled with um, a, health, a public health kind of approach, that recognizes not only the importance of peer networks, but that also recognizes the link 
to alcohol and binge drinking and the links between alcohol binge drinking and hostile masculinity <coughs> and peer networks. A restorative justice response, I believe, can be coupled with that kind of public health awareness can be particularly beneficial um, on campus. That means also recognizing that there are institutions that have what we might call hot spots, um, borrowing from a criminology uh, kind of framework, um, for, for rape or misogynistic culture. I'll just point to one example. So the Campus Climate Survey in the, in the states found that more than 25% of the sexual assault victims who were incapacitated, and that's, that's by alcohol almost entirely, said that their assailant was a fraternity member. So a restorative justice response is the, has the opportunity to move not only from that kind of individual um, perspective, but then to do that kind of work that needs to be done on college campuses to address the importance of this very lethal kind of combination. Um, and then though recognizing that kind of context then can feed into reparative plans. It feeds into reparative plans. You see it here at Dalhousie again um, in terms of the kind of educational mission that can come from um, uh, those who do harm, who recognize the changes that need to take place in the institutions on campus, in the social networks. Um, it can come in terms of reparative plans that address alcohol problems when that's um, um, both an individual problem as well as a collective problem. So that's one. The second way um, that I think an anti-subordination RJ kind of process on campus can be particularly meaningful, and several um, people have spoken of this, is that a, such a process has the potential to recognize the importance of intersections. So we know that, um, for example, recent research uh, that was put out by the US Bureau of Justice Statistics, research on nine college campuses, found that there was a much higher percentage of campus sexual assault for non-heterosexual female students than for heterosexual female students. National US research um, is, it finds very similar kinds of results, but particularly high rates for women who self-identify as bisexual. CDC finding, for example, an astounding 46% of the women in their study who identified as bisexual experiencing sexual assault in their lifetime, 46%. Very little of what's going on in the, um, in the national response to campus sexual assault in the US is looking at these kinds of um, particular risks. Very little of it is looking at um, the risk for indigenous women or looking at risk um, for women of color. National research in the US, for example, finds that Hispanic multiracial women and Native American women have much, much higher rates of sexual assault as well. But what I mean by an intersectional approach is not just recognizing differential risk, as important as that is. What I mean is looking at the extent to which um, the campus climate around race, the campus climate around sexual identity, sexual orientation, campus climate um, around class, something we talk which is very little about in the US context, it just doesn't exist. Um, Right. I mean, looking at the way in which the campus climate along all of those axes intersect with the campus climate around sexual assault. So it is about who's vulnerable, but it's also about what are the um, restrictions and the barriers to providing assistance, what are the risks that accompany disclosure, what are those differential risks. And we desperately need to do that, and I think RJ is a vehicle for doing that. Oh my goodness. Um, wow, five to zero. Uh, so let me just mention really quickly just two concerns I have um, going forward. 
One is what, um, it may be only a lawyer, I don't know. But I'm really very concerned about um, the fact that statements that are made to a Title IX officer, all the evidence that's collected by the administrative process in the U.S. is admissible in a criminal case. It's admissible, potentially admissible, as statements against interest or as party admissions um, in civil and criminal cases that follow. These are not privileged conversations, and I worry about that in the RJ process. There are some fixes, but, um, but we don't have them yet. Um, and I also worry about capacity building. I am concerned that most of our campuses really don't currently have the staff who are ready and able, even if they're convinced, um, to do restorative justice. And I'm not sure um, how widespread among restorative justice practitioners there is an awareness of the issues around gender violence. So I, I see um, I see capacity building as a significant issue.